Hello and welcome to Electrical Engineering 102, Signals and Systems. Okay, I will be your instructor. My name is Achuta Kadambi and I'm joined by two wonderful TAs, Guangyang Zhao and Sasha Safanov. We are all with the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. Now, this class is remote. Let me start by just explaining what that means. The first thing is that remote classes have been tough as well on the faculty and staff because this class, which is ordinarily done on the Blackboard, is now being transitioned to slides. There is going to be some uh, learning curve to that. And uh, if you have any feedback on how I can make it more seamless, please feel free to email me anytime. Because this class is remote, we're going to video lecture the lectures. That means that questions cannot be asked during class. In this case, we're going to try to go for what's called a flipped classroom model. A flipped classroom model kind of originated at Harvard. And the basic idea is that students actually watched a video lecture before coming to class. And then in class, it effectively turns into office hours. It effectively turns into office hours where the students ask the professor questions about the class or do a group activity. Now, the flipped classroom model is pretty good for the remote session. You can watch the video lecture online virtually, and then you can use my office hours effectively to discuss topics in the lecture. My office hours are Wednesdays from 4 to 6 p.m. We're going to handle professor office hours through Zoom. So you're going to use a Zoom link shown here. That Zoom link has a meeting ID, 492-507-3084. The meeting ID will not change from week to week. It'll be always the same meeting ID, so you're welcome to bookmark that link. Although you can drop in at any time to the chat room, or to the Zoom room, it is highly preferable that you send the calendar invite so we know to expect you. The office hours are perhaps best used not for homework questions, but I think for class concepts. And I also actually welcome questions about what is going to be on the exam. Okay, so the purpose of this lecture is to talk about what this class is about how it relates to electrical engineering and computer science, and of course, discuss the class logistics at the very end. Although a required class, the topic is fun and it's used in industry on a daily basis. A quick note on the slide credits. These slides are credit to other faculty who have taught this long-standing class, in particular, Jonathan Cow, Professor Daniela Kabrick, Professor Christina Fraguli, Professor John Pauly and Professor Byron Yu. We thank them all. In particular, slides are almost directly adapted from Jonathan Cow's class at UCLA. Let's begin. Signals and systems. What are signals? What are systems? Well, before we start, let me begin by saying that our world and society relies on our ability to capture information, represent information, and act upon this information. If you look at the entire tech industry, it sort of falls under one of these buckets, the capture, the representation, and the action upon information. In fact, it is this information and our action, you know, our, this context that actually powers uh, our transformation as a society from hunters and gatherers on the left-hand side to one that had a written record of history. So this could be like a signal, right? And then we had a system of disseminating that information throughout the world, right? This is, for example, the Gutenberg Press. So this is uh, before EE 102. Then we got to signals, and now we're at systems. Okay? And so this class deals with signals and systems. In a more modern view, you can look at signals and systems as our ability uh, to power a whole bunch of technology companies. So there's something called FANG, right? FANG stands for Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. 
And a lot of undergrad students, whether right or wrong, they have this intense desire to go and work at one of these tech companies. Now, if you look at these tech companies, they're all sort of falling under this class, right? If, if we look at Facebook, we share information here. If we look at Netflix, we're also sharing movies. If we look at Google, that's basically a way to store massive amounts of data and so on. So these technology companies are acting in a signals and systems manner. So let's break it down one more time. The capture of information is also known as sensing. Okay? We're going to sense this information. The representation is known as a signal. And the action is known as a system. I'm going to draw a strike through through the capture of information. So here's a strike through because we're going to learn more about this topic in the other areas of the EE department, right? The physical and wave electronics, as well as the circuits and embedded systems. In this class, we are therefore primarily concerned with the representation of information as signals and the action upon information as systems, which brings us to the golden rule. Information is a signal. The change in information is due to a system. We can study some concrete examples of signals and systems. So these are some examples common in the EECS fields, electrical engineering and computer science. One example, my voice is a signal. The cell phone is a system that records it, transmits it, communicates it, and then finally it reaches another person who hears it in real time. YouTube videos are a signal. Our computer or phone is a system that plays these videos. They can adjust the resolution based on our Wi-Fi speed. They can adjust the playback speed depending on how fast or slow we want the video to go. Moving a mouse on a screen or typing on a keyboard is a signal. Our computer then uses circuits, really, a system, to translate this information to show you an updated computer screen. Okay, let me just enable my video here as well so you can see me. But signals and systems are not limited to digital signals that we study in ECS. Any physical or abstract quantity that can be measured is a signal. Anything that changes a signal is a system. Okay? So these two things are general abstractions. They apply to almost any type of um, field that you can think of. For example, in economics, the federal deficit is a signal. Policies that are passed by Congress, the interaction of national and global economies, these are systems. Perhaps relevant to our current times, the concentration of a virus in the body today is a signal. And our immune response is a system that modifies or acts upon that signal. Mm -hmm. Sensory and visual evidence is also a signal, and our brain interprets and processes this information acting as a system. Mm -hmm. As a check your understanding question, See if you can identify examples in your daily life. When we deal with a check your understanding question, you're welcome to pause the video, answer the question, and then you can move on to the next slide. Okay, one of the things that you will see is a block diagram in signal processing. You have an input signal, X, and that goes into a system, and then you have an output signal, Y. In this case, the domain of the signal is time. A block diagram is used to decompose a problem into components. So you take X, you put it into a system, and you get as output Y. Later on, you will see how this abstraction of systems enables us to chain systems together into composite systems. This, the art of signal processing and why this uh, block diagram is seen frequently in courses is because almost any physical process or technological process can be uh, articulated in this block diagram form. For example, 
I could have as input, X would be a low quality image, like a blurry image. I then go and put that through some system. And that system's goal is to act upon the signal, right? So the system's goal is to unblur the image. And then you end up with an output Y, which is a sharp image. This exact block diagram and this exact problem shows up in other classes in our department, such as EE114. The art is in articulating this as a system. Okay. You know, you want to articulate the system. And based on that, you can find properties and system design to essentially go from input to output. As we have seen, there are a wide variety of signals and systems. We've talked about cell phones all the way up to viruses in the human body. How do we rigorously represent signals and systems? So we have all these signals and systems. The goal of this class is to rigorously represent signals and systems. And the short answer is there are several ways to represent signals, all of which we will learn about. It depends on how we aim to represent them, what we want to do with them, and what sort of tools we have in our arsenal to analyze them. So here are three examples. The first is traditional signal processing or Fourier analysis. Signals here are one dimensional and do not have a noise model. So for example, I might have a signal. Here I have time. Here I have the amplitude. And I have some signal here, x of t. And I can look at this value, let's just call it t naught, and I can actually get a value here, x of t naught. This is a traditional signal processing problem. Signals are one dimensional, do not have a noise model. They show up in radio, comms, control system, circuit analysis, and we'll also talk about music today in specific. Going down the list, we have another kind of diversity uh, uh, sort of theme here called statistical signal processing where signals are multidimensional and incorporate noise models. Uh, examples include communication over noisy channels, information theory, control, noisy control, as well as imaging. Finally, we also have machine learning. In machine learning, signals are multidimensional and incorporate noise, but we use pattern matching techniques to essentially aid us in learning how to manipulate these signals. Examples include AI, neural networks, deep learning, prediction systems, and unsupervised learning. These topics will be discussed, you know, there are multiple classes at UCLA that deal with these uh, three segments of the diversity in signals and systems. However, we are mostly interested in the first aspect in this class, traditional signal processing or Fourier analysis, where signals are 1D and do not have a noise model. Again, examples, radio, comms, control, circuit, as well as music, which we will discuss in this lecture. Excellent. So now let us understand what is a signal. A signal is nothing but a function of one or more variables. For example, a concrete example of a signal would be the weather. So if I was living in, for example, Boston, Massachusetts, If I'm living in Boston, the weather changes. And so the airport in Boston is called Logan Airport. And every month they take a temperature reading at Logan Airport. So you have essentially an axis here and you have Jan, Feb, March, April, all the way up to December. And you can actually plot the temperature at every month. So in January, it's pretty cold. February is a little warmer. March is a little warmer. April is a little warmer. And then around December, you're back to cold again. So this is an example of a signal. This is a discrete time signal. In general, a signal is a function. We hopefully are familiar with functions from math. But basically, it's something that accepts an input x and returns an output y. So when you see this dot notation here, 
that just means it's an open call. That means that there can be any variable there. So for example, we're going to say x is the input, y is the output, y equals f of x. Now, usually this functional mapping is from the field of real numbers to the field of real numbers. So this maps from one real number like three or four or five to another real number like six, seven, eight. Signals are usually in this class analyzed in the time domain. So the time domain is most of the focus of this class. Signals usually accept an input time t and return the value of the signal at that time. For example, you have this x of t, which denotes the value of the signal at time t as shown on this plot. We can think of a signal as a sequence of values through time. So here's a whole bunch of values. You can represent this, for example, in both discrete or continuous form. So for example, here in this slide, it is shown more in continuous form where you have an infinite number of points, right? We have t0 to some sort of t infinity timestamps. But you could also, just like we showed with the example of the Boston Logan temperature, you could collect temperature readings or discrete time series readings at different sampling steps. This is known as discrete time signal processing if we do it this way. The key concepts that we should learn is what structure we look for in signals. And we ask ourselves two questions to follow up. The first is, is the structure that we have identified in signals useful to us in general settings? And once we have found that structure, we ask, what kind of systems do we design to exploit phenomena in the structure? This lecture will provide an overview of these key concepts. It is OK not to grasp all of it in lecture one. In order to provide an overview, we will start with a concrete example of music. Shown on the left here is a guitar. And the guitar makes sound if you have strings that vibrate. Okay. One way to look at the guitar is to look at notes. So here, for example, is, uh, let's think of the guitar. The guitar kind of looks like this. It has a neck, and it has a body, a hole here, and it's got strings. Okay. The strings terminate at this point on the guitar, called a bridge of a guitar. Okay. So the bridge is like an anchor point. So this. If I, if I think of the string as a rope, like we have from our high school physics classes, this point here would be the anchor point or the bridge. Okay. If I look here, I have another anchor point here. So because the string is not anchored in this in-between location, right? the string is not anchored in between, therefore, the sine wave that this takes on could be something like uh, you know, the sine wave with a sort of period that goes like that. Now, if I want to change the pitch of the sine wave, there's a lot of ways to do it. But if I'm playing guitar, one of the things I might do is I might put my finger down. I might put a finger here to play a different note. So I put my finger down here. What that's going to do is it's going to change the anchor point. Okay. So now the anchor point is not all the way here. This is no longer relevant. But actually, the anchor point is here. And so you're going to end up with a shorter uh, sort of region where the string can vibrate. And this actually creates a higher frequency note. Therefore, if we look at this signal, we can analyze this as in terms of sine waves. We can look at musical notes purely as sine waves. For example, sine of 2 pi ft. Okay. Now, in the case that f equals 1 hertz, So let's say I have f equals 1 hertz. Then I'm going to have this kind of plot here, where I'm going to have time. 
And at one second, I'm going to have a sine wave that spans something like this. Now, suppose that I have put my finger down, let's say I put my finger down halfway. So suppose F equals two hertz. Now, what I'm gonna have is I'm gonna have a signal. Here is my one second mark again. This is T. And I'm gonna have a two hertz sine wave there. These waves can be generated merely by putting your finger at different locations. If we look at sound, what sound actually is, is it's a movement of the air molecules that follows a longitudinal wave structure. So for example, here the amplitude is high, low, high, low, high, okay, and so on. Sound cannot exist in a vacuum because the air molecules don't follow this wave-like oscillation pattern. There are no air molecules to carry the sound. If we look at how sound is uh, modified by the body, uh, sound comes in through your ear canal. So sound enters here. So here you have your wave. Here's high, low, high, low, high. So sound comes in. And what happens is it strikes a sequence of bones. So you have different bones, very special bones, that then go and feed in to a membrane. It leads into this uh, sort of uh, spiral-shaped membrane here, which is filled with fluid. Okay. We call this fluid membrane the basilar membrane. And what it does essentially is that sine waves, at, you know, oscillations at different frequencies uh, that go in here at 20,000 hertz, for example, or 200 hertz, these different frequencies will actually activate different neural patterns uh, in the fluid structure. The fluid is going to enable different waves to propagate differently, and then there's a grid of neurons inside connected here uh, called the cochlear nerve, and the cochlear nerve essentially can spatially understand what sort of frequencies that were sent. So in short, this ear instrument that we all have, what it does is it converts a sequence of sine waves in terms of the pressure oscillations into different neural activations. Music is something we've all heard. It's fundamentally a sine wave signal, x equals sine 2 pi ft. The tone of the note is determined by its frequency denoted by f in the equation. Every note has a unique frequency associated with it. For example, c is at 261 hertz, c, d, e, f, g, and as you ascend in the alphabetical order, the frequencies go higher. Eventually, you run out of alphabetical characters, right? We go C, D, E, F, G, and there's no H note. Then your scale starts back up at A note, so A, B, C. So therefore, you're going to duplicate the alphabetical character, but the duplication is set so that this occurs every eight steps, essentially, or every octave. Within different octaves, you have essentially double the frequency. So we know that every note called C is going to be some multiple of 261.6 hertz shown here. All right, let us look at a concrete example of a signal. This is a signal. So as a check your understanding question, what kind of signal is this? If you look visually. Right, remember this x-axis is time and the y-axis is the amplitude. Feel free to pause the video and then we can continue after you've answered the question. Okay, welcome back. So some of you may have seen that there's some sinusoidal elements here, but it's not a sine wave. This signal answer is called a chirp. C-H-I. RP. A chirp signal is one where the frequency oscillates over time. It ascends over time. So for example, we start at the note C, then we go to D, E, F, G, A, B, and then we end again at C. 
So the sound that is made, if I play this through a speaker, I would hear something like just an ascending pitch, for example, uh, something like that. So uh, what we have here is in this block, we have an F1, we have an F2, and all the way up to three, four, five, six, seven, and then here's an F8. Okay. In this particular example, F1 equals 261.6 hertz. And F2 equals 293.7 hertz. Now, uh, as another check your understanding question, let's say I gave you this signal. Okay, I know that F1 and F2 are 261.6 and 293.7 because I generated this note. I generated this note by combining these keys on the piano, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Now, as a check your understanding question, if I were to give you this signal, say this was a stream of Python data, right? Just imagine that this was a list of a comma separated value of numbers corresponding to the amplitudes and every time step uh, equally spaced time step. So if you were given this signal as a data, so given this signal, How would you tell me that F1 was 261.6 hertz? Okay, feel free to answer the question and then rejoin us. Okay, welcome back. So those of you who paused the video and answered the question, you may have realized that what you can do is you can actually break the signal up. I can kind of see that there are these discontinuities here. And within this region, I can actually estimate F1 by looking at the peak-to-peak -peak distance. Okay. Remember, I can estimate the period, which is the repetition cycle of the sine wave, and the frequency is just one over the period. Now, unfortunately, this is not easy to do. Okay. You need to figure out exactly where to break up the signal and you need to do all this counting of the peak distances. It's a very slow and laborious process. It turns out that there's a, another golden rule to this class. Every signal has a spectrum and is determined by its spectrum. You can analyze the signal either in the time or in the frequency domain. You can ignore spatial domain, that's a more advanced concept, but you can analyze the time in either the sig time or in the frequency domain. Okay. Now, Let's deconstruct this quote. What is a spectrum? A spectrum is nothing more than a representation of frequencies that make up a signal, okay? So for example, if I look at uh, this uh, signal, this is in the time domain. This function right here is shown in the time domain. If I wanna show this function in the spectral domain, I would actually want to tell you how many mixtures of C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C it has. I don't care about the volume of the signal over time. I care about the frequency content. Now, if I look at this signal once again, so this is my chirp signal. Now we're going to look at an alternate way of characterizing the frequency distribution of the signal. What we're going to do is we're going to take something called a Fourier transform. What we're going to do is if I look at this signal, I can essentially, I know that this is C, D, E, F, and so on. This is at 261.6 hertz, for example. This is at 293 hertz. What I can do is I can take something called a Fourier transform. We will spend a total of about five lectures on the Fourier uh, analysis, two on the Fourier series and three on the Fourier transform. So there are about five lectures on this topic in class. 
However, the short answer of what it does is it takes this input x of t. So you take your time domain chart here. This is the blue signal here. Then you put it through what's called a Fourier transform, FFT. This stands for fast Fourier transform. And then you get a signal representation x as a function of f. So what this has done is it allows us to take a lowercase x of t and map it to a capital X of F. Okay? So you can see the domain has changed from time domain to frequency domain. Now, if I wanna look at the Fourier transform of the signal, I can get here the amplitude. So this is the amplitude. And I get the frequencies across different uh, ranges. So I go from 200 to 600 hertz on this axis, and I can tell you exactly the peaks here. So right here is a peak. This peak arises at around 261.6 hertz. This peak arises at about uh, 293 hertz, and so on. Okay, that's where these peaks arise. Now, the Fourier transform very clearly tells us that this is C, D, E, and so on, without having to do any type of uh, detailed uh, sort of peak-to-peak -peak calculations and trying to really like look at the signal, find the zero crossings and stuff like that. All you have to do is you take this as input, uh, take a Fourier transform, and then figure out where on the frequency axis these peaks lie. Okay. Now, we can go one layer deeper into this we can actually plot a, a temporally varying spectrum. So this is a little bit tricky. If it doesn't make sense, uh, don't worry too much about it, but this is called a spectrogram. We will discuss it later in class. A spectrogram is a very difficult, uh, is a very different representation where you actually end up with a heat map of the frequency amplitude over time. What you can see is that for the chirp signal, the frequency increases at discrete jumps. I encourage you to pause the video here and look at this figure to see if it makes sense. Okay, welcome back. So if we look at this figure, we have uh, time versus frequency. And effectively what each of these are is this captured at this time is in green. This is an orange. Each of these vertical lines here, these vertical blocks that are approximately 0 0.1 seconds, are sampling periods in which I'm going to sample the Fourier transform of the signal. Okay. So what that means is that I'm going to take my original signal, here we have this signal, and I'm actually going to uh, break it into blocks, right? The first one was green, I believe. Yes, it was green, orange, purple. So right here, I'm going to treat everything here as the green zone. This is the orange zone. And this is the purple zone. What that means is I'm going to take the time domain signal I had before and chop it up like I'm cutting pizza into different slices. So I'm going to have this slice as being a separate signal. Right here, this green slice. This orange slice as being a separate signal, and so on. And within the, each of these separate signals, I'm going to take a Fourier transform of that smaller chunk. Okay. So if I take a Fourier transform of this chunk here, how many peaks should that have? So this is a check here understanding question. How many peaks should the Fourier transform have of the green chunk? You can pause the video and we'll resume. Okay, welcome back. So the each chunk in this particular case because it's a chirp signal should have only one peak. So let's look at how we represent these chunks. This is the Fourier transform of each chunk. You see that the y-axis has now become frequency and you can see that each chunk 
has an ascending frequency. So for example, this peak arises at approximately 261. This peak arises at around 296 hertz. Okay. This is useful if we have a signal whose frequency content starts to vary at different timestamps. For example, if every day of the week I sing a song in a different octave, then you would see such a jump. Okay, in our previous example, it was super easy to see why sine waves are useful. What about when it's not as clear? So here's an example signal. It looks almost like noise. Again, you have the same axis, time versus amplitude. And this signal looks almost like noise, but it turns out that we can analyze the building blocks of the signal in a very intuitive form. What do you think made up the signal? So check your understanding. What building blocks of notes, of musical notes, So pause the video and we will resume. Okay, welcome back. So the answer to this question is actually, I don't know. If I look at the signal in the time domain, I have no idea what kind of sine waves made this signal up. I have zero clue. So what I'm gonna have to do is something very different than what you did before. Remember the previous check your understanding question, you were able to sort of look at the zero crossings and the peaks and figure out what the frequencies were. In real world examples, that won't be super clear. So you take a Fourier transform to analyze the signal. So we take an FFT and we can see what kind of sinusoidal building blocks made up the signal. If our analysis is good, uh, if the signal is kind of well behaved in that it's made up of very clear sinusoidal building blocks, then we, we take an F of T, we will end up with an F of T with a few peaks. That would be the goal. So let's take a look at what the computer tells us about the F of T. Okay, here's the F of T of the previous signal. In the X axis, I have frequency here, and on the Y axis, I have the amplitude of that frequency. Now, if I look here, each of these notes, this is the C note, this is an E note, and this is a G note, okay? Each of these notes occurs at a different point on the horizontal axis. Remember, the horizontal axis is frequency. So what these notes are telling you is that it's saying that this note is occurring at 261.1 hertz, this is occurring at 329 hertz, and this is occurring at 393 hertz, okay? It's a super easy way to intuitively look at this very complicated signal. Now, we can also introduce our first example of a system. Okay. Let us come, uh, come up with a concrete example to assess this. Let us pretend that um, this note here, which was C, let me just draw it in green. This note here was C. This note here is orange and this is E. And this note on the right-hand side is black, that is G. Now, let us pretend, for the sake of argument, that the black note here was played by one instrument. This is played by a trumpet in an orchestra. And the orange note was being played by a saxophone. Now, in this particular orchestra, it turns out that the people who play trumpets and saxophones are really bad. They're really bad musicians who are just starting. So maybe I want to come up with a representation that actually goes and uh, removes the contributions from the saxophone and the trumpet and leaves the only note, the note C. So this note here, which you want to keep, this note is done by a star singer superstar singer, okay? So let's say it's Justin Bieber, for example. So Justin Bieber is singing the note C and you wanna keep C while removing the saxophone and the trumpet. 
Now, it should be clear that in this simple representation of the frequency domain, what I can sort of do is I can simply cut out the saxophone and the frequency. So what I've done is I've taken that peak, the peak that corresponded to the saxophone, I've set it to zero, and the peak that corresponded to the trumpet, I've set that to zero. So the only thing that remains is Justin Bieber singing in note C. Now we have essentially isolated the signal and what we can do is we can actually take an inverse Fourier transform. And that will actually give us a nice filtered version, an isolated version. Let's call it isolated for now. Of Bieber without the trumpet, saxophone. Okay, so let's say I do that. So I first start with my signal X of T, which is very difficult to analyze. Then I convert it to a frequency domain representation. Then I go ahead and modify the frequency domain representation with the tilde. And then finally, I convert it back to a modified version of a time domain representation. So here, x of t to get to x of f will be a Fourier transform. Here we would do some thresholding. This is thresholding, right? And then here we would do an IFT. So let's say we do this. If we apply this sort of box diagram here, this is what we get. So this is the version of the system that we now get, which isolates the note C. And you basically have Justin Bieber singing the note C. It should be clear that it would have been very difficult to get the same note from the previous case. So when I had C plus E plus G, it would have been very difficult to go and do any isolation in the time domain. Impossible, nearly to isolate different notes in time domain. Okay. So we filter away E and G in the frequency domain. And then we end up with this sort of isolated representation. Okay, this is an example that shows the use of a system. This portion here is a system, right? This portion here is a system that is being applied to the signal on the left-hand side to give you a new signal on the right-hand side. So when we talk about music, we're talking about sine waves with frequencies of Hertz. We have all heard about Hertz before. An AM radio, for example, has frequencies like 800 kilohertz or 106.1 megahertz. In general, you have uh, communication bands, for example, AT&T at 900 megahertz, Wi-Fi, and 4G LTE. In general, the frequency spectrum of the world is very carefully uh, regulated, the FCC spectrum, Federal Communications. Uh, FCC regulates spectrum. And these frequencies are sine waves that allow you to transmit data at these sinusoidal frequencies. For example, AT&T is allowed at 900 megahertz, Wi-Fi is allowed at 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. It is in general a crime to go and build a custom device that transmits at these same frequencies because you can confuse uh, mission critical comm systems. Wireless technologies also rely on sine waves. So it's no exaggeration to say that these technologies, which are part of our everyday life, are now 
so important but cannot exist without the material that we will learn in EE 102. So it would not be an exaggeration to say that this class uh, will give you a deeper understanding of wireless communications. However, the question really is whether sine waves generalize. Meaning, the sine wave example is clear for music and also a little bit for Wi-Fi, right? With a Wi-Fi router, you're literally transmitting a physical wave, a radio wave that operates at that frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. But a lot of signals in real life don't look like sine waves. So now the question is, is all this stuff that we are learning about the Fourier transform, is that actually relevant? The answer really goes back to our golden rule or this quote, remember, where in this class we're going to simplify it to the time domain, which is that every signal has a spectrum and is defined by its spectrum. Every signal. So note that he's used the word every signal. A signal can be almost anything, concentration of virus in the body. So this is a very general quote. It applies to almost anything. Here's one example of the diversity of signals we can look at. This is a straight line. Here on the bottom, we have a black line that is straight. The goal is to come up with a representation of this black line using only sine waves that closely approximates it. So what is our goal? Our goal is, let's say we have a function. This is our function x of t. And we want to make an approximation to x of t called x hat of t. And the constraint is that x hat of tree t is made up only of sine waves. If we have this constraint uh, and we use only one sine wave, then this is the closest approximation to the line using only one sine wave. You can see that the approximation is you know, decent uh, in this region, but there's a lot of error here, right? There's a lot of error here as well as here. Okay, so there's a large residual or distance between x and x hat. You can quantify this by saying distance or error this is the approximation error equals some sort of distance between x hat of t, x of t minus x hat of t. Okay, this is known as an L2 norm. So what we could do is we could actually go through and we could say, let's use multiple sine waves to approximate that line. So instead of using one sine wave, I'm going to use three sine waves. Okay. And you can see that now, if we look at this region, our approximation is better. We can scale this up. Let's go to five sine waves. The approximation is even better. Now we can go to 10. And you can see that we're nearly matching the line. And of course, we can go all the way up to 100, where we see a nearly exact line. So this is the reconstruction with 100 sine waves. So we have reconstructed a straight line with using sine waves. It turns out that it's not just about straight lines. It's not just about sine waves. But basically, if you have enough sine waves, you can reconstruct anything. Okay, that's the idea. So that's why the motivation for this class is mastering sine waves and using sine waves as the building blocks of signals, because it turns out that sine waves, if you have enough of them, can approximate any signal. Here's a concrete example. Uh, this is a signal that you would never think could be approximated by a sine wave. What it is on the bottom left, what we have here, is we actually have a picture. So this is a picture of two penguins. Now, if I look at this picture or any photograph that you take with your camera, there is no way that you connect a photograph that you take to sine waves, right? Uh, a picture of a sine wave would look something like this. But here's a picture of a horizontal sine wave. So it's like kind of like um, a one-dimensional sine wave over a 2D grid would be, it would be like kind of light here, there'd be a, a dark band here, it'd be light here, dark, light, dark, and so on. Right, and so this you can imagine would be a sine wave in an image. So this is like your pixels. 
horizontal pixels, vertical pixels. Okay. And then you would have another sine wave like that would look like this, right? A vertical sine wave. So it turns out that any image like this image here is the sum of all these pictures at different frequencies. So I can add up, for example, this picture at this frequency, this picture at this frequency, then I can add up their vertical equivalents by rotating them. And if I add up enough of these, then I actually get back. So this plus this and then a larger amount actually gives you any sort of image. Because of that, we can, now that we have uh, that context that any image is made up of sine waves, I can actually have systems that go and preferentially filter out sine waves, just like we did musical notes. And based on that, you can get different characteristics for images. So a class that deals with this exclusively in our department is EE211. The bottom line is that once we understand the mathematics of how to create things with sine waves, we can do extremely powerful operations. This is the basis for almost every technology in ECS. In many ways, in my opinion, so in my humble opinion, I am HO, this is the most important class of the EE major. I'll put a question mark there. So leave it open to interpretation. The applications of signals are nearly endless. If you look at analog circuits, every circuit element can be you know, analyzed in terms of a system that manipulates an original signal. For example, the AC voltage from the battery is a signal, and then a combination of resistors, capacitors, transistors, and so on act as a system to manipulate that signal. In magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, what effectively happens is that uh, physicians or doctors or bioengineers are not actually capturing this image of the brain. So this is an MRI image, magnetic resonance imaging. But what is actually being captured by the instrument is the Fourier transform of the brain, meaning that if we go back to the imaging example I showed you about the penguins, I actually capture all those building block sinusoids that make up the penguins. And then I do that instead of the penguins, I do that for the human brain. And it turns out that due to various mechanical and physical reasons, it is easier to capture the sinusoidal representations of things inside the body. And this actually won Nobel, Nobel Prize. Jerome Singer. Uh, of course, we have control systems, how we control robots and actuate arms and so on. We also have music, mixing music, and we went through a concrete example where we uh, removed the trumpets and the saxophones and instead uh, retained Justin Bieber's voice. Now, uh, more in the area of my own research, we have applications of signals to virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, okay, as well as computational photography. So this is the idea of building special cameras and instruments uh, that exploit signals and systems uh, that can be embedded on mobile phones or self-driving cars. In the signals and persistence perspective view of VR and AR, one thing that you might do is you might uh, think of the display that you display as a signal emitter. and a human brain as a system. So the punchline is signal processing is ubiquitous. We interact with systems that use this math every day. Luckily, the math is well-developed and has precise analytical solutions for many problems. Signal processing provides a way of thinking about how to interpret, encode and decode information, as well as manipulate information. I personally know many biologists, doctors, engineers, mathematicians who must learn this stuff for their job. Uh, in many cases, and I also am guilty of this, I perhaps didn't learn the material when I was an undergrad well enough. 
uh, because I often found in graduate school or in industry, I would have to go and brush up on this exact class. In fact, uh, I will give you a quick anecdote. One of my cousins is a physician, and I remember reading his textbooks. He was in his uh, late 30s at the time, so he's between 30 and 40 uh, years old, and doctors have to repeatedly take exams to recertify. And in fact, they would actually continue to test him on concepts from this class. Uh, they would actually ask him about sinusoids and the Fourier transform in his uh, board exams for medical certification, all the way up until ages 30s and 40s. There's a lot of future work that you can study if you master the uh, concepts in this class. In the future, everything we will discuss in this class will generally be deterministic, but noise is a function of the real world. The real world has noisy signals. So it is important that we understand how to generalize concepts from the class to the real world. So in this class, if we would discuss a signal, here's, for example, an x of t, right? This is our one hertz sine wave. But if I want you to analyze the frequency of this, you could simply pop it into a Fourier transform. But what happens if, for example, I give you a sine wave like here that is actually corrupted with noise? OK, so I have random noise. Now, depending on the amount of noise, we may be able to still pop it into a Fourier transform, or we may have to do something else to the signal. And so this concept will be discussed more in EE131. Another example is multivariate signals. So in this class, we are working with signals that are univariate, which means that the value at, of the signal at every point in time is a scalar or a real value. In the real life, signals are sometimes vectors. This can mean that the signal is multidimensional and needs to be described with linear algebra. Luckily, we don't need to deal with linear algebra as much in this class. However, it is very important if you want to go further in this field. Briefly, I'll describe a little bit about my own research because I use signals and systems almost every day. Uh, one example project that I worked on, and in general, you'll see this with Zoom, by the way, Zoom video chat is that these are videos. And so I will just write down the video to let you know that there's a video here, and I will describe what the video is doing. If you want more details, please discuss with me in office hours. Basically, this video is showing a billion frames per second camera. A billion FPS camera is so fast that it's able to actually capture light in motion. Let me start by giving you a concrete example. Let's say you're sitting in your bedroom right now and it's dark. As soon as you click on the light, it appears that the light turns on instantaneously. Uh, in the real world, what actually happens is that light has a finite speed of travel, and therefore the light from your light bulb in your room is going to reach the furthest corners of the room a little bit later, a tiny, tiny fraction of a second later. In fact, a few nanoseconds at most. What we did in this work was we built a billion frames per second camera. If we have a camera that is a billion or a trillion frames per second, you're actually fast enough to see light while it moves. So in this particular case, while I turn on the light bulb, I can actually see light as it propagates through the world. The math that we used in this paper and patent are all based on signal processing. And so by the end of this class, hopefully you will also be able to come up with similar equations of your own. Another example project that we have in our lab at UCLA is teaching machines how to discover the laws of physics. Imagine if the next Newton or Einstein is not a person, but instead an artificial neural network. And the way that we do this is we actually give a neural network a sequence of videos. We give it a video stream of people tossing balls, for example. And if you toss enough balls, then the network, it should, just like Isaac Newton watched a video of a apple falling, we want a neural network to learn that y equals v naught t minus 1 half dt squared. Okay? That's what we want our network to learn. And if you look here, that's exactly what our network learns. 4.55 t is about half uh, the gravitational value. The last example of my own research that uses signals and systems is predicting car accidents before they happen. Once again, these are videos. What they are showing in this video 
is a card that is backing into another car, an accident happening. And what we are doing is we're actually analyzing the image. The image is a signal, and then we have a system that analyzes this uh, signal to actually output a risk score for when an accident can happen. Based on this analysis, we can actually predict about three seconds in advance, three seconds before an accident happens. Okay, let's move on to the last topic of this lecture, which is the class administration. Lectures are going to occur on Mondays and Wednesdays of every week of instruction, okay? So there are 10 weeks of instruction. If lectures occur on Mondays and Wednesdays, there would ordinarily be 20 lectures. However, we will only have lectures with new material on days that are not holidays or exams. So for example, May 25th is Memorial Day, And June 3rd is exam two, and 429 is exam one. So there are these three special days during which we will not have lecture. Therefore, there are 17 lectures of concepts that you need to be familiar with. In addition, there will be two review lectures provided as a courtesy so that students can review exam material. I will come up with sort of the cliff notes of what's gonna be on the exam during exam week, okay? To help students uh, target their studying. Lecture duration. During lecture, I speak pretty fast if I can. And since we're doing video lectures, what I'm going to do is have shorter videos. These videos are gonna be shorter because I'm not waiting for students to complete the check understanding questions. Uh, we're also not taking questions from students. And of course, you don't get the bad jokes. Therefore, the lectures are much shorter than ordinary in-class lectures. If this is a problem, please email me. Even though we are virtual, it is my uh, job to give you a fundamental understanding of signals and systems, and therefore we will cover no less than the in-person classes we would do on a Blackboard. Uh, it just so turns out that the video lectures are slightly shorter. Should this be an issue, please email me in the first week of term and we can think about extending the lectures if need be. Okay, homeworks. Homeworks are due on Friday of each week of instruction. So every Friday, the homework is due at 11.59 p.m. There are three exceptions. Three exceptions are gonna be the first week of class, which is this week, as well as the two exam weeks. Homeworks will always be released the preceding Saturday. So for example, if you calculate, you have 10 weeks in class. If you had a homework for every week, you would ordinarily have 10 weeks, but you have three exceptions. So therefore you have seven weeks in which homeworks are due. The due dates are shown on the right here in this table. Homework one is due Friday, April 10th. If we release the homework every preceding Saturday, then the homework would be out Saturday, April 4th. Homeworks are going to be representative of the difficulty of exams. I uh, highly encourage you to uh, do the homework on your own, but you're also welcome after you have worked out individual solutions to uh, talk to your classmates if you need help, as well as Piazza. We highly recommend using Piazza as compared to talking to individual classmates because all students have access to the Piazza. The exam structure. There are two exams, a midterm and a final. These are the exam dates, 429 and 63. The exams will be cumulative and honor code will apply. Now, in this unique time, so unique situation for coronavirus due to COVID, we will make exams take home. We will make exams take home. Uh, they will be the same length as if we were giving an in-class exam but you will have access to the full day. You will have access to notes and you will have access also to the internet, okay? So exams will be take home and you will have access to online resources. So full access to online resources, except your classmates. 
So please do not ask your classmates for solutions because exams must be done individually. Grading structure. If we were to put these building blocks together, this is your grading structure. Uh, the homework is 30%, the exam number two, the final is 40%, and the midterm is 30%. Now you'll see that this adds up to slightly more than 100% because we have bonus points. I will expand on what the bonus points are in a moment. Grading is not going to be based on a predefined curve, but actually on our best assessment of how well students are prepared to apply course concepts. So these are general thresholds here. And uh, most likely, uh, we set these thresholds uh, so that students have a goalpost to set from, and we will honor them. However, we also reserve the right to adjust upgrades, meaning that if I decide to uh, be more generous in the grading, we reserve that right. Bonus points. So bonus points are up to 2% of your grade. This should be 2%. Okay. Bonus points are up to 2% of your grade. 1% is awarded for Piazza, and 1% is awarded to the whole class if we have an 85% response rate in student evaluations. Regarding Piazza, please use Piazza for the class discussion. So the TAs in discussion will uh, instruct you on the Piazza, uh, how to join. It'll be completely student-driven. Answers are gonna be provided by other students. At the end of term, we will assign bonus points the students who we see have been participating constructively in Piazza. Sometimes students email us uh, right before a homework or an exam. So we cannot always answer emails immediately. So for example, if a homework is due less than 24 hours and you email us, you may not be able to respond. In some cases, there may be extenuating circumstances or personal matters, in which case you should feel free to email me directly. All other inquiries should be sent to the TAs and please CC both TAs so they can decide how to balance the load amongst themselves. The textbook is optional for students who would benefit from additional practice. You can think of this as drill questions. The textbook appears to be available on Amazon Kindle, so feel free to take advantage of that deal. However, lecture slides and homework are your main exam study guides. And if you master what's in the homework, if you master what's in the lecture slides and can follow the discussions on Piazza, you should be in very good shape to get an A in the class. Here is a rough sketch of topics that we will go into. Uh, we have completed lecture one where we go over the class overview and what signals are. And now we will go into deeper detail in signal operations, elementary signals and systems. If you'll note, we have about five lectures on the four year analysis and transforms. And we also have three lectures on the Laplace transforms. These are major concepts in the class. So a little bit about me. Uh, I have been teaching at UCLA since the summer of 2018. My research is to teach machines how to see the world to make next generation factory robots. So imagine if factory workers were blind, because that's basically what robotic animation is. If I put a blindfold on factory workers today, that's effectively how robots are behaving in industrial settings. Uh, also self-driving cars or cell phone cameras. My experience is both academic and industrial. Uh, you know, <laughs> academically, I write papers that maybe like 20 people in the world read. Uh, industrially, I work with companies and file patents like many of you will go on to do after you graduate. Other courses I teach at UCLA include CS188, E211, and EE239. The teaching philosophy I hold is a bottom-up approach. We start with basics before discussing advanced concepts. Uh, this class is also structured following Professor Cal's outline, which I be believe is also bottom-up. Uh, in contrast, if you were to take the class with Professor Kabrick, she will first cover Laplace transforms uh, in a very early manner, which gives you more of a top-down approach. Uh, in contrast, we will cover Laplace transforms only towards the end of the class. Again, the length of lectures, as we have discussed before, is not important to me. Uh, my own education did not occur at schools where lectures were two hours. Therefore, I try to make lectures as short as possible, uh, but with the same content. Uh, you'll find that if you pause and actually go through to check your understanding questions, you should be getting the same content as if you were sitting in a two hour lecture. Uh, all, I also believe as a teacher that uh, uh, Effectively, you're not paying to learn from a textbook. 
uh, I believe lectures and homeworks, if well designed, are more effective than uh, a textbook. So with that goal in mind, exam questions are drawn both from lectures and homeworks rather than uh, the variety of textbooks in the field. That doesn't mean that you should not read textbooks. So some of you may benefit more from a textbook style. Of course, keep an eye out also for the checking your understanding questions. Uh, in past classes, I have been known to use checking your understanding questions on actual exams. Uh, in somewhat of an unusual style, just continuing to teaching philosophy, usually when I teach in person in ECE, I actually encourage students to use phones and computers to scan online resources while in lecture. So, you know, even today in my professional life, if I'm sitting in a talk or a seminar, I will often be following the talk with kind of like one eye and then also Googling the topics that I don't understand because it's very hard to have an understanding of everything in real time. So for example, uh, when we were talking about signal processing, you can kind of jump ahead to Google Images and type in signal processing in Google Images and you'll get all these cool pictures. And you can see that this left-hand side uh, picture looks very similar to some of the diagrams that we were talking about in class. By the end of the video, hopefully when you go back to the Google Images, you understand more of the images that are presented. You're also welcome to ask us questions about, you know, what does this image mean? Like, why is this, you know, in binary? What does it mean? So uh, signals and systems is super, super important. Uh, this is just a photo from my Gmail email to this day. So this is my Gmail, and this is the photograph I use as my icon image. And you can see it's two signals that are very special to me. They're from one of my first projects in college. Okay, so that concludes lecture one, and I will see you again for lecture two. In terms of the logistics with TAs, TA logistics, Uh, they will describe to you their preferences in how they want to structure their office hours. Their discussion sections will be video recordings as well. And their emails can be found on slide two of the deck. All right, thanks for your attention.